Hi, today we're going to see how to solve the Schrodinger equation, which is this equation here, for the case of a particle moving inside an, a box in one dimension where the walls have an infinite potential. The Schrodinger equation contains first a, a kinetic energy term that contains the second derivative of the wave function psi of x a, as a function of a, x plus the potential energy term equaling the total energy term. So we are going to deal with a case where the potential V is a constant, which could be zero or different from zero. And we are going to focus on the case where the energy of the particle is larger than the constant potential V inside the box. So how to solve the Schrodinger equation? We're going to test a few functions. We're not going to assume uh, many things before. So we can try a function of the potential type, a constant a times x to the power of n. We can also try a rational type of function where we have a x to the power of n inside a term in the denominator of a function. We can try a decreasing exponential function with a constant a times the exponential of minus k times x, k is another constant. We can try a cosine function and we can try a complex exponential function. And we're going to see that the last two are uh, solutions for the Schrodinger equation. For the first case, we take the first derivative of the function psi of x uh, as a function of x, and we get the constant n times a times x to the power of n minus one. If we take now the second derivative, we get n times n minus one times a, times x to the power of n minus 2. So n could be any positive or negative integer. But if we replace the second derivative function on the first term of the Schrodinger equation, and then we replace the original psi of x in the other terms, we will see that this equation cannot be solved because we will get different powers of x. We get x to the power of n in the second term and on the right side of the equation, but we get x to the power of n minus 2 on the first term. So this cannot work. If we try for the second function, we'll get this semi-complicated uh, fraction for the first derivative, and I'm not even going to attempt to do the second derivative because we will get more terms but it is sufficient to see that we have an exponent of b plus x to the power of n, all this elevated to the power of 3 in one of the terms, and the original term is uh, the binomial is elevated to the power of 1. So if you try to replace this in the Schrodinger equation, you will see that it will not work either. For an exponential, decreasing exponential function, if we take the first derivative, we get minus k times a times e to the power of minus kx, and the second derivative, we will get the minus k again multiplying, so we get k squared, and we get again the exponential function. If we see this, this could work, but you could see that the first term in the Schrodinger equation has a minus sign, and the others don't, so we see that we will get a minus sign in here equal to two positive a constant, so this will not work either. We will have a sign problem. So this is why a complex exponential function actually solves this equation, as we will see later. But first, let's check the cosine function. So the first derivative is a times k times sine of kx, and the second derivative is minus a times k squared times cosine uh, kx. So this actually will work if you replace it in the Schrodinger equation, this will be a solution. You can test it and we will get to this solution later. But first, let's see the complex exponential. So the first derivative is minus i times k times a times the same exponential. And in the second derivative, we get minus k squared times a times the exponential. Why? Because the minus k times minus k gives positive k squared, like on the normal decreasing exponential, but the i squared term is uh, i is the square root of minus 1, so i squared is minus 1, so we get this minus sign. So we can actually replace this 
second derivative and the original function on the Schrodinger equation, and we will see that this is also a solution. So the last two were solutions, and we could try many other uh, functions, but we have found two uh, possible solutions here. So I'm going to write now the solution in a more general way. I'm not going to demonstrate this, but I'm going to say the solution is a linear combination of two complex exponentials, one with a minus sign and one with a plus sign. This is a, a similar but more general solution than the one that, that I have shown before. When we solve differential equations, it is important to start with a general solution, which then we can make more specific for a particular problem depending on the boundary conditions, for example. So if we take the first derivative, we get the first term is multiplied by minus i times k, and the second is multiplied by plus i times k. We take the second derivative, and again, we will get i squared, times k squared, and in both cases we have a positive uh, sign, but because i squared is minus 1, we will get a minus k squared times the same function as before. So basically the second derivative is minus k squared times psi of x. If we replace this in the Schrodinger equation, we will see that this is also a solution. So if we replace the second derivative in the first term of the Schrodinger equation, we will get the plus h bar squared, where h is Planck's constant uh, over 2 mu, mu is the mass of the electron, times k squared times psi of x, plus v, which is a constant, times psi of x, equals the total energy times psi of x. So psi of x equal to zero would be a trivial solution, but if psi of x is different, is in particular a complex exponential, as we have said, uh, we can basically simplify this out of the Schrodinger equation. So we get here that k squared times h bar squared over 2 mu plus the constant potential b gives us the total energy of the particle. So up to here, we get the energy of a freely moving particle in a constant potential. We have not yet described the particle in a box problem. So k can take any value and it can take any value here. But when we confine the particle, we will get a, a quantization of the energy levels. So now we're going to discuss the 1D infinite square well and the boundary conditions that we get. So in black, we can see here the shape of the well. So the well starts at position zero and ends at position L, where in here in this simulation, L equals one. One is, I'm solving all these problems using dimensionless units. So L equals one and L equals zero is the um, sides of the box. And inside the box, the potential will be zero, V will be zero, and outside the box, V will be very high, tending to infinity. I cannot put infinity in the calculation in the computer, but I can give it a very large number. So our boundary conditions tell us that the, we want the wave function to have zero value at the borders of the potential. Because if we have an infinite potential outside the box, we cannot have any probability of finding the particle in there. So the wave function outside the box has to be zero. And because the walls already have an infinite potential, we will also say that the wave function has to be zero on the walls. And we will also add another condition, but this is, we are not going to use this condition right now, is that the uh, derivative of the wave function has to go to zero at each wall. So again, we have the general solution, and this is the first derivative, and we are going to set the boundary conditions. We already know the general solution. Now we're going to try to specify the values for the constants a, b, and k to get a particular solution that will depend on our particular 
a box, we see that the boundary conditions imply that psi of x equals 0 has to be 0 and psi of x equal plus l equals 0. So we replace x by 0 and by plus l. So we get a times e to the power of minus i times k times 0 plus b times e to the power of plus i times k times 0. So an exponential to the power of 0, even if it's a complex exponential, we have a value of 1. In the other case, we will get a different uh, condition. It's We get a times e to the power of minus i times k times l. Well, this will have some value. It will be a number. And the same for the second term. On the first case, where the exponential have a value of 1, so we basically get that a plus b has to be 0. So this is the first information that we get from the boundary conditions. So a equals minus b, so we can replace here in the second term b by minus a, and we can get the a outside of the parentheses. So we get e to the power of minus i k l minus e to the power of plus i k l. So what we are going to use here is Euler's theorem that expresses that a complex exponential that has an argument multiplied by plus or minus i is equal to the cosine of the argument without the i plus minus i times the sine of the argument without the i. So this is an important, very important theorem and very useful theorem. So here, this is basically boundary condition for uh, the case of psi of l. So this is what we got in the previous slide. And we will expand each of these exponentials using Euler's theorem and we will get the cosine and sine terms. We will see here that the uh, cosine terms will cancel and we will get minus 2 times i times a times sine of k l. So this will be the boundary condition. So we want to find the uh, conditions of the argument of the sine function that uh, equals 0. The terms multiplying are just constants that cannot be zero in general, for a general solution. We know that sine of zero radians, a pi radians, 2 pi, 3 pi, etc. radians equals zero. We can establish a condition that the argument kL of the sine function has to be equal an integer n, which can take value 0, 1, 2, etc. times pi. So now we can replace the condition for k in the argument of the sine function. But first, we will put the minus 2 times i inside the a constant because we have not specified what value the a constant had to have. So we can basically replace this and say a is a new constant that takes into account uh, these other terms that appear here. Uh, it is a general constant that we have not yet determined. We replace here the condition and we'll get that psi of x is a times sine of k times x, where k is n times pi over l, where l is the dimension of the box. And if we replace the condition for k inside the expression of the energy that we had here, we will get that the energy is a n squared times pi squared times h bar squared over 2 mu over L squared plus the constant potential V, which in this case could be zero. Now we have the solution for the energy and we have the solution for the wave function, but we have not yet determined the value of the A constant. So we cannot determine this unless we put another condition, which is the normalization condition. And this condition is that the integration of the wave function times its complex conjugate psi star over all space where the wave function is not zero has to integrate to one. So in this case, the wave function only exists inside the uh, square well and we have zero uh, value of wave, wave function outside. So basically we can integrate the square of the wave function between x equals zero and x equals L. If we replace here our wave function psi is a uh, real not complex so basically the complex conjugate is the same as the function 
we replace here and we get a square times sine square of the argument n pi over l times x integrated uh, by uh, the differential of x. This has to equal 1. We get the a square outside because this is the constant that we want to determine and we need to integrate the sine square function over this interval. We will not actually do this integration but we will graphically see what value should it take. We know from trigonometry that sine square of some argument u plus cosine square of that argument u equals 1. And if we plot the sine square of a function between 0 and L here, we know that the sine functions in here, the wave function, has to have nodes on the walls which are at 0 and L. Our sine function has to start at 0 and have a 0 value at L. So this is the sine square in blue and the cosine square is basically 1 minus this value. We see that the red and blue lines add up to 1 over the interval uh, 0 and L or it would also be true for other intervals. What we see is uh, the integral between 0 and L of the sine square would be the area below the curve. But we can see here that both functions, sine and cosine squared, are basically mirror of each other. So we can see that the area under the curve is half the total area. What we see is that the, this integral of sine square has to equal the area of the rectangle divided by 2. And the area of the rectangle would be L times 1. So we get here that all this integral is L over 2. We get that our integration of the uh, normalization condition is A squared times L over 2 has to equal 1. So this tells us what the value of A should be to get the normalized wave function. A has to be the square root of 2 over L. So now we have all the information we need. We see that psi of x equals uh, the square root of 2 over L times the sine of n times pi over L times x. And we have this expression for the energy. So the energy should have a subscript n because the energy will now depend on n. Before, k was not necessarily quantized in the free particle, but we have now quantized the values of k and uh, because we require that the function has nodes on the wall. So this confines the particle and gives us quantization. So we are not going to go further in this video. We are not going to graphically analyze what this means. Uh, we are going to do that on a following video. This was only the part of the mathematics of solving the Schrodinger equation for the particle in a 1D box. I hope this has been useful. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. Thank you very much.